Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here this morning. And can I just say you're very welcome. Uh, all of us here this morning, it's great to see you. Uh, if you're a visitor with us this morning, can I just say that you're especially welcome. We have a number of visitors here this morning. And can I just say it's great to see you here. We're going to begin our service by reading a few verses from Psalm 150 together. Psalm 150. Uh, Psalm really is a praise. The psalmist writes in Psalm 150, Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens, praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his excellent praise, praise him with trumpet sound, praise him with lute and harp, praise him with tambourine and dance, praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that is breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to stand together and we're going to sing Adam Calvary as we praise the Lord. So let's stand. Amen. Yeah. 
we thank you that we can come here together this morning, come together and sing your praises. For you, you are truly a God who is worthy of our praises. We thank you for all of the ways in which you daily provide for us. Father, we thank you for the, the ability to get up this morning, for the breath in our lives. And Lord, we thank you just for this opportunity to meet the young. We pray that you do meet the Lord that you speak through your word. We pray that you would help all of them as he shares. Speak through them and challenge each one of us, preacher and listener of it. And Lord, encourage us, rebuke us. And Lord, if there's any amongst us who are watching online who as yet have not put their faith and trust in you, may this be the day and may you challenge them and convict them. Father, we pray for our Sunday school teachers as they will teach Sunday school this morning. We pray for all the children who will be out. We pray that you speak through the Sunday school teachers and may they have a good time out there this morning. For all of our the weekly events in the church, Lord, for all the ones that the departments in the church. We thank you for them. We thank you for the volunteers that you come to. We just pray that you would do a work in this area. But Lord, for this morning, Lord, may we know your help and may all of the said and done bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. At this point, Thank you, George. Well, this morning uh, for us as a local church, it is a very uh, special occasion. Um, on Wednesday evening, we had a special members meeting uh, to vote in a number of new deacons. But also on Wednesday evening, uh, we informed the church that we would be uh, welcoming on board as well a new elder. Um, I'm going to ask the, the elders to come forward. And I'm going to ask also Trevor Stewart, who uh, indeed is the one who uh, is coming on board as an elder uh, here this morning. So if you all could come up to the front, and Trevor, you come as well. 
And as I say, it is a, a very special occasion. Um, we're going to bring up the two new uh, deacons as well in a moment or two. But first of all, if ever we'll get you on camera here, you could stand in the middle there. Now you're to smile and uh, look good uh, in it all, so you are. Um, but uh, what we see in the Word of God is that uh, for the church, uh, that God uh, raises up elders and deacons as the leadership of the church. And to say, uh, we are privileged uh, that we have a number of us as elders, but over the last while, really, we've been seeking the Lord uh, as elders as to raising up uh, other elders within the church and indeed uh, the Lord has laid Trevor upon our hearts and Trevor has sought the Lord and uh, Trevor indeed has agreed to come on board as an elder uh, and really just want to uh, indeed remind us all really of the responsibility of elders. Uh, there's a number of passages in scripture uh, that speak of this and the responsibility. I'm not going to go through the full list uh, that you find in 1 Timothy 3. Uh, we'll do that for the deacons in a moment because it also speaks of deacons there. But over in 1 Peter 5, uh, verses 1 to 4, it says this about the elders as Paul wrote, or sorry, as Peter wrote uh, to the believers of his time. He said, The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being as examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, Ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And what we see is a tremendous responsibility upon the elders of the church. And this is something uh, that indeed we are elders, we're well aware of. Um, but I know Trevor is aware, well aware of as well. He's humbled uh, to be asked uh, to become an elder. He's honoured. And I'm not asking him to speak or anything this morning. Uh, he's relieved about that. Um, but uh, Trevor indeed uh, realises the great responsibility that is upon uh, those of us who are elders. It's not just uh, a position. It's a place of great responsibility, a position of great responsibility, uh, because we are accountable for the local church here. And that's what God has laid upon our hearts. We as elders will have to give a separate account of that uh, with regards to how we uh, do our work as, uh, as an elder. And uh, do please pray for us. Do please pray for Trevor. Um, and they say pray for the rest of us in our role that God would lead us and that God would guide us. And at this point, I'm going to ask Gerald uh, uh, to come and to pray indeed for Trevor, and that the Lord uh, will bless him, and then will extend uh, the right hand of fellowship to Trevor as an elder, say from the rest of us as elders here this morning. Okay, Gerald, thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that you have blessed us here in the church. We thank you for people like Trevor who have had to that number. And Lord, we just pray your blessing upon him as he joins us here in the group of the elder. We pray, Lord, that you will know your blessing together and we might see great things done for you. We ask it in your precious name. Amen. Amen. And therefore, it is, it is my great joy, our great joy this morning to extend to Trevor uh, the right hand of fellowship as an elder. And we do indeed wish you every blessing. And that uh, you will enjoy the fellowship with the rest of us as elders. And indeed that the Lord will use you mightily here. And I'll ask the other elders as well to extend the right hand of fellowship to you as well. And let's give Trevor uh, indeed a warm uh, No turning back now, Trevor. Um, 
Also then, I'm going to ask uh, two men, so we had our, our members meeting on, on Wednesday evening, and uh, really our constitution is that elders appoint elders, it doesn't have to uh, go to the church uh, for a vote, but uh, we had a vote on Wednesday evening uh, for two new deacons, and uh, I'm going to ask Roger Henderson and David Kennedy both to come up, and we'll let you stand in front of the camera as well. Uh, so we will this morning as uh, we welcome you as deacons. Obviously, we have uh, many others here this morning who are deacons. And uh, that's what we see in the, in the Word of God. We see that, say, God's leadership for the church um, in, in, in the present day is elders and deacons. And in First Timothy chapter 3, um, it speaks of, of, of elders. And uh, again, well, some of it has already been referred to over in First Peter 5. But then in 1 Peter chapter 3, from verse 8, we read these words, Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And again, we see the responsibilities, not just for the, for the men, but for their wives as well. And indeed, that's something for all of us, uh, say, as elders and for our wives. And uh, as I say, we take this seriously. And I know that uh, whenever we spoke to David and to Roger, that they prayed, they sought the Lord about it as well. And they realized the importance of this role within the life of the local church. To say they have shown to them, say, are shown to us as a church uh, their faithfulness to God, their love for God uh, as well, and uh, to say their commitment to the work of the church here. And therefore, it is a great joy for us uh, this morning to to welcome both men uh, as deacons of the church. But before we extend as elders the right hand of fellowship to them as deacons, I'm going to ask Luke uh, to come and to pray and to commit both uh, unto the Lord and His blessing. Thank you. So let's all pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us to this point as a church. We thank you even for the unity that we experienced on Wednesday night past as we vote. We thank you for the unity amongst the office bearers. And Lord, we thank you for these two new office bearers that we bring on board. We thank you for David and for Roger. We thank you for how they love you, how they are men of God. And Lord, we pray that you would help them as they seek to serve you in their new roles in the church. Lord, may we be a blessing to them and them to us as a church. And Lord, may all that we as a group of office bearers do seek to bring the glory and honor to you. We pray for special help for Roger and David and may you bless them in their time serving you in this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore, it is our joy and our privilege to extend the right hand of fellowship to them as deacons and uh, as they join the group of office bearers and that the Lord will bless you and that the Lord will use you mightily as well and indeed we enjoy a rich fellowship together here in our service for the Lord. So I'll ask the other of elders as well to extend the right hand. They'll come at you from both directions so, um, and to you as well and I need that the Lord will bless. And again, let's put our hands together and welcome you.
Bible with you this morning as we turn again to God's Word and uh, turning to this passage we've been reading so much uh, of late and uh, again coming to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3 as we continue to look at these really only nine verses which are the title Living in the Last Days and uh, really uh, as you know if you've been here, if, you're, if you haven't, if you're visiting with us, um, well we've been looking at uh, really verses uh, 2 to 5, well, we're in verse 4, we've made it that far, uh, as we look at these characteristics really of the, the carnal ways of the last days. What do we expect um, in these days in which we live? And certainly um, from feedback that I'm getting that many of you uh, certainly feel we can truly identify with these characteristics that are all around us in the last day. But really as we've been looking at them, we don't want to focus so much on how much of it is going on in the last days because to say it is relevant to us or it is uh, before us but really looking at well what we've been doing is really seeking to look at what is our response to, to it all or ought to be how, how does God want us to live we were told what, what's in the word uh, but for us uh, who, who are seeking what is our response to be in these days and um, see when we're working through there's 19 characteristics we're not going to be doing 19 messages all together on them, which is maybe 16 or 17, but um, we're coming to, uh, uh, well, verse, uh, say verse 3, it is in fact, I said verse 4, but it's verse 3 that we're in uh, today, but again, just picking up from verse 1, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers. Last week then we looked at false accusers, and today you'll see the word, well the word in the King James is incontinent. And uh, I think that's maybe more a medical term in the present day. Anybody, uh, some people will identify with that, say, well, doctor, I've got a problem, and he may say, well, you're incontinent. But we're looking at that more so this morning, as in the context, um, some people are wondering, what exactly is he talking about here this morning? Um, I'll let you work it out in your own mind, so I will. Um, but uh, as we look at this uh, word here this morning, this subject, very, very relevant to us in the present day and not relevant in the terms of running to the doctor uh, for, for help, but um, Daniel asked, I think that's how you pronounce his, his surname, um, in a secular article called, Who's in Charge Here? He wrote these words. Life in modern Western cultures is like, ha like living at a giant all-you-can-eat buffet offering more calories, credit, sex, intoxicants and just about anything else one could take to excess than our forebears might have ever have imagined. With more possibilities for pleasure and fewer rules and constraints than, in, any, than ever before, the happy few will be those able to exercise self-control. And what is it we often hear people say in the present day? The world is out of control. God is still in control with that, I have absolutely no doubt, because what I believe, what we're seeing is, God in fact is in control, that these things that seem out of control, that actually God has prophesied about them, and God is telling us that everything, all, every part of his prophetic calendar, is all falling into place, piece by piece. And say, God is still in control, he always will be, but when it comes to man's actions or to mankind's actions that I think it couldn't be summed up better by the, than by these words that we have here from Daniel Acts. The word incontinent is rendered self-control or without, sorry, without self-control. In all the other versions that, uh, that, 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 that maybe you're using or the more popular versions, the NAV, the ESV, and to so say, they, I think for most of you here this morning, it'll be that phrase without self-control that you have before you. That the NLT renders it and have no self-control, which really is the same thing. The Greek word is akrites, I don't know if that's pronounced right or not. 
Um, I hope it is, but it, it, it can be rendered uncontrolled passions. And really because of this, and because God has told us that there's going to be this intensifying of all of this in the last days, just before Christ returns, well, we're living, to say, in a day where, where we see death, uh, uh, we see death spiral, really death has spiraled out of control, has it not? Many people have their credit cards maxed out. So bad is it for some that they're struggling just to pay even the interest that they owe on them. And um, I, I was interested to find out that as a nation, as a United Kingdom, um, the, the United Kingdom in debt, uh, what does it owe? Well, it owes $1,827.2 billion, pounds, uh, say there at the end of October 2022. Not point, not sort of one point eight billion, but one thousand eight hundred and twenty-seven point two billion pounds is the debt that was at the end of October uh, for for the United Kingdom as a nation. In fact, it went up by seventy-three point seven billion pounds from the October before. So we can see really what it is doing is it is spiraling out of control. Um, and saying this, I understand that it's not all down to people not controlling their finances because well, we, what we know is in the past year or so, um, increased costs have caught a lot of people out, which has resulted uh, in, in a lot of this increase in debt. But what we also see in the present day is that alcohol abuse is worse than ever. It's the same with drug abuse. What we also see is that marriage breakdown is ever increasing owing to adultery in a lot of cases. A married man, a married woman, was, uh, they couldn't control their lust of the flesh and they sinned uh, before God uh, in terms of adultery. Then we think of promiscuous living. Well, that's it before marriage. Promiscuous living uh, before marriage is at an all time high. The world's viewpoint on this is definitely not the same as our viewpoint, uh, which is biblical. And uh, what is it they focus on? They pr focus on promoting what they call safe sex, which really is their way of trying to prevent a pregnancy. Rather than promoting the biblical teaching, um, which uh, is that sex before marriage, outside of marriage, is sin. As I say, when it's not in the marriage context. Then we think of how pornography um, it is a multi-billion pound industry worldwide, as men in particular are addicted to this, but then we know that many women also are prepared to sell themselves so as to fulfill the out-of-control desires of many men in this world. Then we think of something even like fits of rage. Fits of rage are also prominent as people lose their temper in the present day even over the most ridiculous of things. I wonder have you ever been in that situation where you've been on the receiving end? Or maybe somebody who's just lost their temper, lost, they've gone into a fit of rage and it's maybe been over the most stupid thing and you thought to yourself, what on earth has just happened? We think even of road rage nowadays. And uh, people, uh, as I say, people get uh, and a real fit of temper, maybe we're all guilty of it, but some have certainly gone beyond maybe what most people have gone. Uh, we, we might give off at times to other drivers, but uh, it has even got to the point where people have even got out, uh, they stopped their car, they put out, and they fought with the other driver. And um, certainly, uh, I think maybe more so in America, uh, where people have even shot the other driver dead because of maybe a, a, a wrong move that they made or they were driving too slow or they, they were driving in, in, in a ridiculous way. And really as we, as we look at all these this morning in the same pot, um, and no doubt there's many others that I could mention this morning. Uh, but really what I want to do is, I, I want to know four things as we look at this word incontinent here this morning. I want you to consider, first of all, with me, what I'm calling a personal responsibility. I believe this morning, whenever we come and we look at this subject of, of new self-control, that there is, there has to be a personal responsibility. I find it most interesting 
I've already said, I've, uh, I've referred to the ESV, the NIV, and a couple of other uh, versions that maybe you have before you this morning, that they, uh, that they render the, the, the Greek word acrates uh, with the phrase, without self-control. And what I find most interesting about this is that they don't, they don't translate acrates as without control. But instead they have opted for the rendering without self-control. And, and, and I trust this morning that you, you see the difference really in this this morning. That, 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 that to say they use that word self. And I find this most interesting because we are living in a culture, are we not? Where everybody, whenever they do wrong, or not, maybe not everybody, but a big percentage of people, whenever they do wrong, what is their immediate reaction? It's everybody else's fault. But theirs. It's everybody else's fault. But theirs. It's a culture where no people no longer take the blame for their actions as they blame somebody else. And uh, really this morning, as, as we look at this, you'll find a couple of references there. 2 Samuel 12 and 13, Psalm 51 and verse 4. I take my hat off to King David. Whenever Nathan confronted him regarding his episode of adultery, lies, and then arranging the death of Uriah. Now, I don't take my hat off to what he did at first, where, uh, where he committed sin uh, of adultery with Bathsheba, and then he told lies, and they reckon it was uh, for about a year or so, and then to say he had arranged for the death of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. But what I take my hat off to is the fact that whenever Nathan confronted David about this and said to David, in 2 Samuel, he said to him, Thou art the man, he used the illustration, uh, about sin, and he said, Thou art the man, and David's response was this I have sinned against the Lord. He says, I. Ah. He didn't say Bathsheba. He, he didn't try to blame Bathsheba for the adultery. He, he realized that actually it was his sin. And what I find most interesting as well, and this is a challenge to us all uh, today because of our sin, because sometimes, yes, when we sin, yes, we sin against somebody else. And I believe that we ought to say sorry to them and seek to put the matter right. But what is it he said? I have sinned against the Lord. And that's a, a great truth we need to remind ourselves of in the present day. Because all sin is sin against God. And that's the seriousness of this of, of, of sin. And thinking to ourselves, well, uh, if I yield to temptation, it's only going to involve myself. Or it's only going to involve myself and somebody else. Understand, it all involves God. That all sin. Is sin against God, and, and uh, David, as he committed adultery, whenever uh, the, the whenever the uh, the penny dropped, as it were, and say, been challenged by uh, Nathan, he said, "I have sinned against the Lord." And then Psalm fifty-one was, really was written as as a psalm of repentance um, out, out of what happened with David. And, and what's interesting is how he he refers to himself a number of times. But he doesn't say, say, try to blame anybody else. He doesn't try to blame Bathsheba. He says, have, curse, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out, then he says this, my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before thee. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. And done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou, judge, thou judgest. What we need to see is that our actions are our, our responsibility. That we can't become like the rest of culture today and we blame somebody else and we say, oh, I, I, I did this because of my, my, my grandparents or because of my parents, it's all their fault. No. We have a free will. And to say, whenever temptation presents it before us, we have the word of God, don't we? That has told us time and time again that we're to flee all temptation, we're to resist the devil. 
And therefore it's our own actions. And therefore we need to come before God. And what a blessing it is if we're somebody here this morning. We know we've sinned against God. And we know that we're not living a right before God in the way that we should be. Now what a, what a blessing it is that, that he's a God who pardons us whenever we come and seek his forgiveness. It says, his blood that cleanses us from all sin. Would it be this morning that you're somebody and you're not saved and you're saying, well, in fact, maybe this is the stumbling, stumbling point for it all. That you're not prepared to come to that point where you will acknowledge that you are a sinner, that you have great difficulty with the words of Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 where it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But you're saying, but oh, look at me, I'm all right. I, I compare myself with a, with a Christian who lives up the road and in fact I think I'm better than them. And I say today that the word of God it never says once. <coughs> compare yourself with another Christian. <coughs> with a neighbour up the road. With a work colleague who says they're a Christian. What would you need to say is yourself as compared to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is absolutely perfect. And that's why it says in Romans 3 and 23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're a sinner in God's eyes. And as a sinner, you're condemned on the road to hell. And that's why you need the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you need to be saved. Because if you're dependent and you're standing before God and saying, God, I, I think it's better than the way down the road. Simple react, the reality is, is that the Lord will say to you, depart from me. Ye that work in the day, I never knew you. I never knew you. Today, when you're not coming, put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, I believe the starting point of salvation is is, is recognizing that we're a sinner. I think of the public and, and the Pharisee. The Pharisee, oh, he, there in the temple, oh, what did he do? He boasted about how great he was. But then what we see also in the temple is that there was also the public and the tax collector. And what is it he cried out to God? God, be merciful to me. Somebody better than the Pharisee? No. God be merciful to me, a sinner. And you see, that's, I believe, it's a, it's a stumbling block for so many people today. They're not prepared. They'll come and say, God be merciful unto me, but they're not prepared to say, to me, a sinner. Because we think we're okay. We think we're not too bad compared to many other people in this world. But all oh, today, we need to see that the Lord says, we're a sinner, and a sinner condemned to hell. And it's only those who experience or come to him and pray for forgiveness of their sin that they experience his salvation. And the great truth is today, you can experience this. You can experience his salvation today. You can experience the wonderful joy of sins forgiven, of knowing that you're going to be in heaven, that when the rule is called to be under, that you will be there, that you'll be there for all of eternity. Will you not come today and put your trust in him? Because that's why he died on the cross for you. He died for me. And the good works will not save any of us, and indeed what will save us is the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's the only Savior for sinners. So we see here, first of all, a personal responsibility as we come here and think of uh, the Lord saying that in the last days that people are going to have no control, no self-control. But then I want you to notice, secondly, a perfect response. A perfect response. Well, what, is, what ought to be the perfect response to this? Say, for those of us who are saved, well, the Bible teaches that really the, the perfect response is very simple. It's, it's taking control of self. It's taking control of self. To say that the phrase is self-control, which we're, we're, we're best, known, uh, or best known to us. It's what the Bible instructs us to do. It's what the Bible makes clear is expected of those of us who are saved today is what the Bible actually commands and commands. And just because the majority of people are living without self-control, just doing this, it's, it's a bit like the day of the judges, isn't it? They're doing that which is right in their own eyes. 
Uh, and just because people are doing that around you at work, because people are doing that maybe in your own house from which you, the home from which you come, just because people are doing it in culture, or sorry, in, in the community around us and across society, it doesn't mean that it's okay for us to do it as well. You see, what we need to remember is that those who are doing it, they're on the road to hell. They're on their route to hell. And for those of us who say this morning that we're saved, is it that we want to live our life down here? We know we're going to heaven, but is it that we want to live our life walking that road to hell? It's the same with those who are already going there. When I read the scriptures, I don't say that that's what God wants of us. I say that He wants us to live holy lives. He wants us. To live lives that are pleasing unto him. And therefore we must understand today that, that we need to take control of the help of the Holy Spirit. Self-control, whenever we look at it, it's listed amongst the, the fruit of the Spirit. We talk about living in the Spirit. Well, the living in the Spirit, what I see is, 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 is the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. What's temperance? Self-control. Now, it might be the last one there, but it doesn't mean it's the least important. They're all equal. And, and, and these are the, 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 this is what walking in the Spirit is, uh, that, that is showing these, is displaying these characteristics, they say the fruit of the Spirit, and self-control is one that is mentioned, and, and, and yet we have to admit, don't we, that in, in the world in which we live, with, with the devil walking about as a roaring lion, seeking who he may be far, it's not easy, because temptation, we have to be honest, it, it faces us all every day. Some people think that as Christians we shouldn't face temptation. I don't know where they get that teaching from. Jesus faced temptation, did he not? Taken out into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted of the devil. And he was tempted even beyond all of that. We will face temptation every day. And let's hold our hands up and be honest here this morning that whenever it comes to self-control, that at times we find it difficult because such is the temptation, such is the power of the temptation at times. So then how do we go about it? How do we ensure that we don't succumb to it every day? Well, uh, a number of verses... Uh, you can jot them all down if you're taking notes. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9 and verses 25 to 27, reading from the ESV, it says this, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, I do not box as one beat in the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. Lest after preaching the others, I myself should be disqualified. What do you see Paul do in the scriptures? As Paul refers to the athlete, to the sports person. And uh, that's a word that we all um, uh, know about. We might not have much interest in sport, but yet we know that for sports people in the present day, that, 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 that they, they push themselves to the limit because they want to be the best in their sport. And pushing themselves to the limit involves great self-discipline. And make sure that they're not going to McDonald's um, uh, uh, every day. Many of them will never go near McDonald's. Nothing against McDonald's. There's some healthy food there. I don't want to get a letter from McDonald's complaining uh, from them. Same with country fried or Kentucky fried chicken and all those places, the local chippies or whatever. But we know it's not the healthiest part. And you'll not find them going to there just to down and have their main meal of the day. They'll have all the, you know, the healthy food, probably the boring food, because that's how we all find that sort of stuff. Um, but but they, they, they're, they're disciplined in their diet. They're disciplined uh, in, in, in their day-to-day -day routine. They're disciplined in their training. Some of them will be up on a day's training done before many of us even get out of bed in the morning. It's the same, they, they, they're doing everything, they bring their body under control, and that's what Paul is saying, that that's the effort that we need to make as Christians so that we can live holy lives, and, and, and therefore 
let's just say it's challenging to us. The perfect response, it starts with the right determination and belief in our mind. You see, if an athlete doesn't have the right mindset, they'll win nothing. And the same it will be for those of us in the Christian life. Sometimes I hear Christians saying, oh, I just succumb to temptation one after the other. But would it be that maybe whenever we rise from our bed in the morning, we don't rise with the right attitude? If we're going to walk in the, in the life of holiness, or we're going to flee from all temptation. Say, so often the battle is lost before we've even started. Our mind is conformed to this word. Instead of being transformed, being renewed daily by the Spirit of God, we're allowing our minds to be filled with all the filth and the nonsense of this Word, rather than filling it with what? With the Word of God. The Word of God. Would it be today that some Christians really struggle with all this because they've not grown as Christians since they could see it? They have not fed themselves on the word of God with the daily uh, sincere milk of the word and then move from the milk on to the meat of the word of God. Perhaps some today are still in the milk whenever they should be on the meat. And today if you're a Christian maybe you're newly saved and you're wondering what is the pathway ahead? What is it I should be uh, as aspiring to, desiring in my life? Well feed yourself on the milk of the word of God. Learn the fundamental basics of of the Christian life, but then move from that on to the deeper truths of the Word of God. And what does that involve? Well, it involves uh, saturating yourself with the Word of God. Perhaps some of us, perhaps some are not even on the milk or the meat, which I think is very, very sad. Why? Because what they're doing is they're filling themselves with all the rubbish and the nonsense of the present day. I wonder at times how many Christians never open their Bible only. The Bible is spiritual food for our soul. But maybe the only time we look at the Bible is whenever we come to church on a Sunday morning. And the next time that you're going to maybe look, look at the Bible is next Sunday morning. Can I ask you to put a, uh, put a challenge out to you if that's the way that you treat the Word of God? Take your food in the same way as well and see what happens. To the Word of God, that's why we teach it at the church. That's why we emphasize it so often. That's why we emphasize the, the midweek Bible study and prayer meeting as well. So that we are equipped for these days in which we live in, with all of this sin intensifying all around us, but what keeps us walking in the faith and walking in the ways of the Lord is, is the Word of God being fed upon our souls. So we maybe make it something that we read day by day. First Peter 2, Peter, he says, newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the Word that he may grow thereby, if so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. But then Paul, Paul makes it clear that that's not as far as we're to go because in 1 Corinthians 3, he says this in verses 1 to 3, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, that is really the same as the Word. Even as unto babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto were, or you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye evil. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Paul was abundantly clear. He was direct at the church. And, 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 and Corinth, Corinth was filled with so much sin. And, and they, they were sent and he says, really, you are just still like spiritual babes, but you should be further on in the pathway now. And all that we don't have a desire just to remain as a spiritual being. But that our desire is to grow, grow in Christ. J. Hamlin, Keatley III, has written a book, Marks of Maturity, about legal characteristics, say, of a Christian leader. And he says, Mark number 10 is self-control. And he says this, he says, one of the basic characteristics of infancy is a lack of self-control. 
Not only do babies need nappies, but they must be carried because they lack the necessary control and muscle coordination to sit up, much less walk or run. If babies are healthy and normal, in time they will develop more and more self-control, a sure sign of growth and maturity. See the way it's all compared with the baby? Today, how, are we, how, how could we be described as, as the people of God? Do we have control? Control of all of these things that we flee from all sin, from all temptation, because we've grown in the faith. Or is it today that there's no control? Because there's been no growth. No desire to to learn the Word of God, to saturate ourselves with the Word of God, to feed our soul with the Word of God. Instead, today, we're like somebody just like that newborn baby that's just done that. It's the same that the people of God wants us to be. See, times go on with a personal responsibility. Um, there's that perfect response, and um, there's a particular reference and it's to men. And you can check those references out there. I, I, I probably get uh, get myself in trouble. Uh, we, we we highlighted the women last week. Do you remember as we looked at uh, false accusers, and somebody said to me on the way out, "Your Christmas card list has reduced um, by half." Um, and I said, "Well, the other half going to be reduced this week." But actually, what you see is that uh, whenever it comes to this characteristic and continence. Uh, what we see is that there's reference actually to men, not no reference to women. It doesn't mean that it's not for women. It's still for women, it's for everybody. But the particular reference for men is actually two areas. Uh, one is church elders, and uh, the other is aged men. You see that in Titus 1 and verse 8, to the elders be a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. That is, elders are to be self-controlled. And then aged men, Titus 2 and 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, self-controlled. I don't know why. I have to be honest why uh, the, the elders and the aged men say this whole group of men, why, um, uh, why, why these uh, two groups of men really are highlighted? Perhaps where Titus was serving the Lord in Crete, perhaps the, some of the elders weren't weren't practicing it as they should be. Same with the aged men. That's something you can, if you find out the answer, tell me. Um, but may it be that for those of us who are elders, I didn't say elders have to be old men. Elders can be young men. But elders and aged men, that we make sure that that we are that we are temperate, we're, we're self-controlled. And we're living that holy life. So then finally, I say with this, a plentiful recurrence. I've quoted from 1 Peter and uh, 2 Peter 1 and verses 5 and 6 says this. Peter, uh, Peter also says, he says, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance. Now we've looked at this in our Wednesday night Bible studies a couple of years ago about adding to our faith these things that really ought to be part of our lives we received, but we knew that we, we then needed to grow in grace. We needed to grow in the Christian life. And say first Peter or second Peter one uh, uh, list seven altogether. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, and all it goes. But what I find interesting about this, John MacArthur, I don't hold to all of his views, particularly his strong Calvinistic views, but yet there's so much that he teaches that is good. And in 2 Peter 1, uh, of 2 Peter 1, 5 to 7, he most interestingly points out this. And maybe you're wondering, why is there a, a, a choir conductor there? Why have we got Louise up on the screen here this morning? Because she has to look after us as a choir, and it's not easy for her. But here's what he says about it, and I thought this was most interesting. He says, ah is to give lavishly lavishly and generously. In Greek culture, the word was used for a choir master who was responsible for supplying everything that was needed for the choir. The word never meant to equip sparingly, but to supply lavishly for a noble performance. And that's what Louise has to do to get us right as a choir. But do you see the picture here? Add to your faith virtue, the virtue of knowledge, and the knowledge self-control, temperance. The meaning is do it 
should work hard and focus very much on self-control. But whenever the temptation comes our way, or the temptations as a world bit, we make sure we have control of it. That our lives are holy. And that our lives are pleasing unto the Lord. And glorify the Lord in every way. It's something we all, no doubt, struggle with. Can I encourage you to pray for each other as a church? That's something I've been encouraging that we do as a church. Maybe you've taken on with people and mentioned it Wednesday nights. You pray for others. Have four or five names of the people you pray for. Pray for them this week for self-control. Pray for yourself. And that we, we help each other so that we're strong in our faith in these days. I see time is gone. I'm not going to sing the closing hymn. And uh, I'm going to pray. And um, Louise then will just play then. So afterwards I'm going to go to the door. And uh, as I say, to give ourselves time for the table here this morning as well. But uh, let's look to the Lord. And indeed, let's seek the Lord's help for this new week, really, as we face temptations. And indeed, that we all commit ourselves to the Lord. And pray. And why not even just where you're sitting this morning? You know, look at who's in front of you, who's behind you, who's beside you. Look for them now. Pray that they'll be able to have that self control. And that throughout this week, we will be able to glorify them. Father, we thank you for your word here this morning. It's a challenge to us, Lord, but it's an encouragement to us as well. That, Father, we can live lives that are pleasing unto you, that we have to ha we can have a self-control. Father, we face temptation each day. We'll face temptation even here in this building, Lord, before we even leave here this morning. Father, help us to live accordingly to your word. Was need our Father throughout this week to feed ourselves on the Word of God, so that Lord God, we're not people who um, are on the milk of the Word, but Lord, that we're people who are on the meat of the Word of God, and able to be strong and to resist our Father all the temptations of of the evil one in these days, and that our lives truly bring glory and honour to Your name. This morning we know that we've sinned against You much, we've sinned against You at all, Father. We've come with sin in our hearts. Give us this morning, and may we 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 own it, we acknowledge it as our own sin, and don't try to blame others. But Lord, we confess it before you. For any who are unsaved, who have never been prepared to say, "God, be merciful to me, a sinner," may to this morning now they come and they do that and accept your forgiveness of sins and your gift of eternal life. Father, bless your word to our hearts. Bless those who will leave us now. Uh, go with them. Your hand upon them for those of us as we remain around the Lord's table. May, Father, we come with worshiping hearts as we focus upon our Savior. We pray it all. In Jesus' name.